Flamethrowers are among some of the most fearsome weapons, be that during their use through history or their portrayals in our pop culture. So why do so many video game flamethrowers lack a spark? Despite the weapon's potential for damage and chaos, the history of fire as a weapon, and the action and excitement that comes from throwing flames in a virtual arena, video games can sometimes struggle to turn up the heat. So we're going to be shining a light on the history of the flamethrower, both virtual and otherwise, as well as digging into how games get this iconic weapon so wrong. Fire has been used as a weapon for thousands of years, from burning torches and lengths of wood allowing ancient people to literally throw fire, to flaming arrows and siege weaponry like mangonels and trebuchets. But the first weapon we could consider a flamethrower, at least by modern definition, appeared over 1300 years ago. Greek fire was an incendiary weapon utilised by the Byzantine Empire toward the end of the 7th century AD. It was most commonly used in naval warfare, where the burning concoction was shot via a pump and siphon mounted to the bow of a ship, allowing users to spray burning liquid onto the wooden decks and hulls of opposing vessels from distance, with the mixture continuing to burn even while floating on water. Greek fire was extremely valuable to the Byzantine Empire, as it was one of their most powerful weapons, with its formula kept a closely guarded secret. Because of this, and through the time that has passed, the exact composition has been lost to history, and is still debated today. However, we do know that it stayed in use for hundreds of years to come, with 10th century military documents detailing a portable handheld projector to be used on both land and sea, and as a defence against wooden siege towers. The Byzantine Greek fire hand siphon stands as the earliest iteration of the flamethrower, but a modern version wouldn't be seen until the dawn of the 20th century. Where on the 26th of February 1915, the German army first used the Flammenwerfer during the First World War. First against French forces outside of Verdun, and again weeks later on the 30th of July against British trenches at Huga. The first concerted use in, in land warfare of uh, flamethrowers is probably the First World War. So 1916, Germany, a chap called Richard Fiedler, comes up with a giant sort of truck size flamethrower operated by a crew and uh, a small one. And that's the beginning of a, a lineage of really quite similar weapons that consist of a tank style backpack. The next version introduced only, only the following year, 1917, is uh, the WEX which is that double donut design. Quite, quite an efficient design and uh, essentially ripped off by the Brits as the number two flamethrower in the Second World War. The horrific successes of the flamethrower would cause the German army to adopt flamethrowers across their front lines. They were used primarily against bunkers, pillboxes, trenches and fortifications with the goal of destroying emplacements or to kill or flush out their occupants preceding the advance of the rest of the infantry. By the war's end, they were also being deployed with similar tactics against enemy tanks and their crew. So the primary use of flamethrowers right from the start was against fixed positions. Into the Second World War, with more mobile warfare again, they're about engaging uh, pillboxes, hard points, bunkers. They're a tremendous psychological weapon because if you're in one of those very defended positions, when that burning liquid comes at you, you're quite likely to hide. You're, very, very much, you're definitely gonna keep, put your head down and not shoot back. You may well flee, but if you stay where you are, you know, all the oxygen is gonna be removed from the space that's being attacked. You're gonna get burnt by the fuel if you get it on you. Getting it off you is going to be very difficult. Yeah, a bad time. While their effectiveness became clear, so too did the disadvantages of hauling a big old tank of flammable liquid across a battlefield. They were heavy, large and cumbersome, and while weapon ranges could vary from 18 to 30 metres, their visible spouts of flame meant that defenders would immediately focus rifle and machine gun fire on the area of a flamethrower attack. The flamethrower's physical and psychological effect was so horrible, some allied generals and politicians reportedly labelled the device as inhuman, and General Pershing stated that any soldier caught with one would be executed. Although, this could have been political grandstanding in response to Germany's attempt to ban the Model 97 trench gun. And while they may have first appeared in the First World War, development and research into flamethrowers would continue for years to come, and they'd be fielded in conflicts across the following decades. 
During World War II, both the Axis and Allies would issue not only new infantry-based flamethrower weapons, but also develop flame tanks and other vehicles to use across the front lines. Across the following decades, through World War II to the Korean and Vietnam Wars, the US continued to make use of these weapon systems. The infantry systems were eventually deemed of questionable effectiveness in modern combat, and since 1978, flamethrowers have not been in American military arsenals. While they may not be a common sight today, short of their civilian use of controlled burning and agriculture, due to their infamy and impact across history, it's no surprise that the flamethrower has blazed a trail into our pop culture. Flamethrowers have featured in our games for decades, from the pixelated embers of flaming side-scrollers to military shooters and RTS titles. Shot. <laughs> but their design, performance and implementation can vary pretty wildly. It's common to see virtual flamethrowers perform closer to an overcharged blowtorch than anything resembling their real-life counterparts, with players spraying wildly and having to move into as close range as possible in an attempt to ignite their foe. And it's likely that this is due to game designers taking inspiration from Hollywood hotshots over history. <laughs> Many film productions, especially in the early days of cinema, used either propane or petroleum-based flamethrowers, creating either short-ranged bursts of burning gas or slightly longer streams of burning liquid fuel. Compared to the intense, long ranges of sticky, burning napalm that real flamethrowers would produce, these were much easier to operate and safer for users, actors and crew, as they burned out much quicker and could be extinguished much easier. There are some exceptions, like the 1982 horror legend The Thing that made use of a military-grade flamethrower, or more recent productions like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Anybody order fried sauerkraut? <laughs> So it's not surprising that many video game flamethrowers have followed the same trend of blowtorch blasts or shorter streams that burn out quickly, but for potentially different reasons. First is the potential extra computational demands a flamethrower could present. I'm sure you can imagine what streams of liquid napalm sticking and moving over level geometry with long burning black smoke spewing flames could do to a game's frame rate or graphics. If flames burn out quickly, have less interaction with the environment, or even disappear as a player respawns, then those previous potential gameplay issues can be avoided. Of course, this implementation of flamethrowers can also affect how they feel when playing with them in games. While in reality the flamethrower's focus was more on attacking structures and emplacements, in games it is almost always a weapon to burn away things of a more organic nature. Be that enemy infantry in the familiar grounded settings of World War I, II, Vietnam or beyond, more bizarre locales like spacefaring ships or alien worlds, or the foul, fetid home of a twisted family in Louisiana. You're going nowhere! Which brings us to gameplay balance. While some flamethrowers in reality could cast their fiery payload from ranges of 20 meters and beyond, virtual versions often have similar effective distance to shotguns. Potentially deadly up close, but leaving enemies barely breaking a sweat just a few meters away. This demand for such close quarters combat becomes all the more frustrating in games where players can injure themselves with their own blazing trails. But whenever a flamethrower is involved, it's often advantageous to cover the area with as much flame as possible, as where they can become most useful is when the odds are against the player, even if they have to battle with limited ammunition or overheating mechanics. In single player set pieces, just a lick of flame can be enough to dispatch an enemy, often in a sobering, screaming fashion. Although it is not unusual for that potency to be then dialed down if the flamethrower makes it into multiplayer, leaving it as an underused option in the game's arsenal with different balance considerations having to be made, such as the player's armor, health or resistances, to make the weapon viable again. However, in those moments where you're beset by hordes of aliens, undead, or something else entirely, and where you are able to take advantage of the video game flamethrower's damage over time or afterburn mechanics, this weapon really gets the opportunity to shine. That being said, according to Max Brooks's Zombie Survival Guide, the only thing worse than a horde of zombies is a horde of flaming zombies. The weight and size of the flamethrower is something else many games have to work around. Even when larger, more realistic models are used, they aren't usually as cumbersome as the real deal. Some titles choose to invent their own flamethrowers, with smaller canisters of fuel mounted to the weapon in view of the player. This goes some way into separating them from real depictions of the weapons, but also offers up opportunities to reload, while also downsizing the device into the size of a rifle or light machine gun, rather than something that is strapped to your back. 
All of which leads us to the pressurized fuel filled elephant in the room. If a player sees that big old backpack, they're gonna wanna shoot it. Aim for their fuel tanks. That should slow them down. I know I would feel vulnerable with quite a lot of flammable liquid on my back, especially if I had to stand up to, to use a flamethrower. But I remember my Mythbusters and um, the chances of igniting the contents of a flamethrower tank seem to be quite low. That said, you could of course use, deliberately use, incendiary or explosive ammunition, intending to blow, blow up a, a flamethrower user. But if you have standard ball ammunition, I think uh, it seems that the chances of getting the right fuel air mixture in the tank for it to actually go up is very, very difficult, if not uh, practically impossible to do. Intriguingly, our LPO50 does have a through and through bullet hole through one of the tanks. So I don't know if um, the MOD were experimenting at some point or what, but it didn't blow up. Almost all games that feature a flame-throwing enemy will grant the player the option of detonating their fuel-filled canisters, sometimes with that angle of attack being easier than facing the enemy head-on and resulting in some visceral outcomes. While they may not go boom if you shoot them in reality, and I believe it's perfectly fine to enjoy their virtual representations, there's no denying that in the real world the flamethrower is a truly horrific weapon. There are some games that touch upon this element with some sobering nudges to the player. I remember playing through a few shooters, trying out various weapons only for their flamethrower to give me pause. In games like Call of Duty World at War or Rising Storm Vietnam 2, there is both an audible and visual reaction to using a flamethrower. There are intense screams from those you hit and player models can sometimes be left burnt on the ground. These aren't effects that you experience the other 95% of the time or while you're playing with other weapons, which in turn also makes them and the flamethrower stick out even more. It might not be something many of you think about or even want to think about while kicking back and playing games, but because of the nature of these weapons and the harm they cause, there is a perception, even within pop culture, that one of the most common video game weapons is, in our reality, a war crime. While this isn't strictly the case, there are prohibitions and treaties that apply to them that aren't a factor with traditional firearms. There have been specific efforts to try to restrict these weapons. There's Treaty 22495 of the 1980 United Nations Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. This, this is quite vague though, it's not specific to flamethrowers. It wasn't signed up to by everyone by any means. The United States only signed up to it in 2008, would you believe? China, for example, still has flamethrowers in its inventory and is not a signatory to that. There's nothing stopping anyone who didn't sign up to it from using flamethrowers. Now, by common convention, they are no longer used. That's probably the strongest protection we have from them is that they're just really bad press. So they've kind of gone away before they've been fully nailed down as something that humanity no, no longer wants to have. Video games are fun, they're escapism, and I'll repeat my earlier sentiment that there's nothing wrong with playing any shooter you want with whatever weapon you want. We can find video game flamethrowers fun while also knowing that in the real world, they really suck. But with that in mind, I do think it's interesting that the shared comprehension and recognition that people have around the flamethrower, as well as how it was phased out in reality, may have somewhat helped shape its life and reception in video games. Games that use historical battlefields as a backdrop may often feature real-world examples of flamethrowers that fit into the time period. Battlefield 1 features the World War 1 WEX as the flame trooper's inventory, Call of Duty World at War allows players to use the American M2 from the Second World War, with its replacement the US M9 flamethrower being carried into the 1960s as the intense and effective version found in Rising Storm 2 Vietnam. There are, of course, moments famous through the history of video games where the flamethrower is twisted into absurdity in comic contrast to the weapon's grim reality. Flammenwerfer. <laughs> flamethrower. I'm sure we all remember Far Cry 3, where it's used as a tool to burn down marijuana plants to the soundtrack of Roaring Flame and Dubstep. <laughs> That's number three. Man, I love this thing. But when unique universes have styles and stories of their own, the idea of a flamethrower is so broad that it can find a place pretty much anywhere, even if it's not always the best weapon available. 
From post-apocalyptic heavy weapons wielded by power armor troopers as they explore the Mojave, or twisted into worlds that are more comical and stylized. Of course, the most famous of all being Team Fortress 2's asbestos suit-clad mumbling mercenary, specializing in hit-and-run tactics and returning rockets to sender with a blast of unignited gas. But there is one genre where the burning torch of a flamethrower can be your light of salvation from the encroaching dark. Horror. I'm talking about horror. Fire has been used to combat all things that go bump in the night since the inception of the genre, and the flamethrower exists as a larger and more fearsome extension of that. For millennia, fire has been used to ward off creatures that could do us harm, and in many horror games, the flamethrower can be used to that effect, most notably against the xenomorph in Alien Isolation, with those brief bursts of flame being the only weapon capable of scaring off the alien. The psychological response to fire is a natural and somewhat relatable one. Because we've been burned before, I believe our imaginations can more easily extrapolate that feeling into having some small sense of what it may feel like being on the receiving end of this weapon. To me, because the virtual flamethrower feels that bit more intense and horrific than most other video game weapons, it makes it easier to turn the weapon against manifestations of fear and horror. From hordes of shambling undead or victims of Umbrella Corporation's experiments to the wicked beasts of Yharnam or even the grim dark creatures of the 41st millennium. The more horrific they are, the easier they are to put to the torch. Ah! The horror genre is a great example of how games and pop culture showcase the flamethrower within the context of their own remarkable universes as a tool to combat hellish monsters detaching themselves from the weapon's hellish reality. While the flamethrower is an iconic video game weapon, it's safe to say that its effectiveness has flickered throughout its virtual life. In a handful of games, it's a powerhouse of destruction, while in many more, it's often easily outclassed were extremely situational. Games understandably shy away from the unpleasant realism of the weapon, instead opting for pop culture flamethrowers that both in function and form largely exist as very different entities, while still giving their players a touch of the intensity that comes with having the gift of Prometheus in the palm of their hand. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Lowdown. If you enjoyed it, please make sure to like the video and subscribe, and maybe even let me know your favorite video game flamethrowers in the comment section below. Be sure to tell us what else you'd like to see Loadout cover, and if you want more video game firearms content, you can watch the previous episodes of this show or check out our weekly series of Firearms Expert Reacts, where I show our friends at the Royal Armouries a selection of guns from our favourite games. Until next time, I've been your host Dave Jewett, and I'll see you in the next one.